All right, hello everyone. This is gonna be a pre-lab lecture for lab two, electric forces and electric charge and force versus distance graph. All right, so in this lab, we're pretty much gonna be investigating a relationship between force, electric force, that two charged particles exert on one another. So basically electric interaction between two, two charged particles whenever there is a finite distance between them. All right, so at this point, hopefully you are already aware of the fact that there are two types of charges. So let's say you have a particle. This particle can be either positively charged or negatively charged. We can also have a particle that can be neutral, but neutral means that basically no charge. Now, what do we mean by charge? Think of it like this, if you have an object Generally, this object has a lot of particles inside. You know, most of them, we're talking about sort of like a subatomic particles. Those subatomic particles come in, let's say three different varieties. Some, you know, two of them have sort of like what we call opposite charges, positive and negative. And the third one is neutral. So, you know, po po uh, electrons, protons, and uh, neutrons. Now, we, pretty much ignore the neutrons because they are not, you know, charged, right? Those are neutral particles. So that means when I'm talking about, you know, let's say charge, you know, I usually mean positive charge or negative charge. That means I, in a way, talk about protons that come as a positively charged particle and an electron, which are negatively charged. Now, if you have an object, so for example, you know, this object can be any size or shape. So let's say here's an object. So this object has a lot of those charged particles. So let's say it has some, for example, positive ones. And it can also have some negative ones. Now, if the amount of positive and negative charges inside the object are equal to one another, so for example, I have now one, two, three, four, five, six negatives and one, two, three, four, five, let's say six positives. So I have six positive charges, six negative charges within my object. Those positive and negative charges are gonna cancel each other because then Q, which represent a charge, a signal, like a charge uh, quantity, right? If I do then amount of Q for, you know, that represents positive charges plus amount of Q that represents negative charges I'm gonna get zero because I have equal amount of positive and negative. And then what I can say is that net Q is gonna be zero. So if I add all my positive charges and all my negative charges, add them together, I get zero. That means the object is neutral. So neutral object. Now, one of the things I can do, I can make this, you know, this object charged. By making this charge, then I can remove some of these particles or give the object some particles. And hopefully in the, in the lecture portion, you learn that the type of particles that are being moved in order to make the object positive, you know, positively charged or negatively charged are always negative stuff, the electrons. So we have this moving electrons generally that can be removed or given to an object for it to be positively charged or negatively charged. For example, think like this, if this is my object, which is neutral, so it has six positive charges, six negative charges, so they all cancel each other. If I wanna make this object positively charged, then instead of, let's say, giving it some positive charges, I'm gonna make it positive by removing some of the negatives. Now think like this, if I remove those two negatives, then what I have here, I have only four negative charges, and I have six positive charges, which means that those two are gonna cancel each other, these two are gonna cancel each other, these two are gonna cancel each other, those two are gonna cancel each other, but then I have two extra positive ones that don't cancel, which means in order for me to represent that this object is positively charged, I will get rid of everything that, you know, come, comes with a pair, that means, you know, end up being canceled out and only represent the ones that, you know, don't cancel out. That means I can say this part, this object is positively charged because it has more positive charges than negative charges. 
All right, so then this is, you know, a way of making this object positively charged by removing some of the electrons, removing some of the negative stuff. Now, for example, let's say here's the object, I put like in terms of four each, right? So this is a neutral object. It has four positive, oops, sorry guys. So four positives and four negatives, let's say. Again, this is neutral because same amount of positive and negative stuff. What if I wanna make this negatively charged object? What do I do? Do I remove protons and then it's gonna be more negative? No, I cannot generally move the protons because if you're talking about the you know basic atomic model, if you, um, I'm sure most of you are aware of that uh, and learn about basic atomic model where you have, uh, you know, let's say nucleus of an atom, which is always positively charged and then you have the electrons. Well, let's say something like this, right? That are kind of, you know, going around. This is just basic, the, you know, atomic model. One of the things we have here is, let's say, protons are inside the nucleus. And there's a very strong force keeping them together inside the nucleus. So going into the nucleus and removing one of the protons requires a lot of energy. So a lot of effort and it's generally not worth it and doesn't happen kind of like on its own. But electrons can be shared, right? You have the valence electrons that can be shared between, you know, between atoms and, you know, they can technically be, you know, if it's in a, you, you probably, if you're taking some kind of, you know, basic chemistry, learn about, you know, the, the electrons that could be in a different orbits and things like that. And the ones that are furthest are, you know, bound to the nucleus with the weakest, you know, let's say force, and they can be easily removed. The idea here is then in order for me to make this negatively charged, instead of removing the, let's say the protons, I'm gonna be adding them, adding some electrons to this charge. I'm gonna add electrons. So then those two cancels, those two cancels, those two cancels and those cancels. And these two that I just added, they don't get canceled. So that means I have an object with a negatively charged. That means the charges that are, you know, moving around and make object positively charged or negative charge, usually always electrons. There are some, you know, some ionic solutions where it could be both, but generally this is what, you know, uh, standard, let's say charging process works. All right, so now in terms of then electric forces, okay, so that kind of like we covered sort of like electric charge. Now, if you have electric forces, those forces then generally due to interaction between two charged particles. Because what I have here is this, thing like this, I have a, a charged particle, let's say, which is gonna be in this case, let's say positive. So I can say this is Q1. Q again, either, you know, uppercase or lowercase represents just a charge in this case. So Q1 means this, you know, particle, particle one is positively charged. And then let's say I have another part, you know, another charge somewhere over here. I'm gonna call this Q2. And these two charges have a finite distance. That means, you know, measuring the distance between them, I can say that, let's say this is some dis distance D. You can say D or R, doesn't matter, right? Distance. So, and it's a finite distance, right? So we're assuming they're not infinitely far away. There's some finite distance. So then this second charge, if it's, you know, let's say positively charged or negatively charged, right? There's gonna be force. So let's say second one is also positively charged. Experimentally, then we learn that two positively charged particles near one another at a finite distance, they're gonna exert force on one another. That means there's a interaction between those particles and the force that they exert on one another always gonna be a repulsive force. That means they repel each other if they have the you know same sign. That means the force acting on Q1 due to Q2 will be repulsive. And it's gonna be along this radial line. See, this is that radial line that, you know, between those particles. So this force always gonna be along the radial line. Now, Q1 gonna be push, gonna be pushing Q, uh, Q2 and Q2 gonna be pushing Q1 away from one another. That means I can say that there's gonna be a force, here's that force, that two exerts on one, which is that's a notation means charge two exerts force on charge one. 
and there's going to be another force right here. This is then charge one exerts on charge two, and both vectors, right? Force is a remember is a vector. Both of them exactly same magnitude, but they are in opposite direction. That means one of the things I can say that F12 in magnitude is equals to F21. They exert same amount of force. So let's say, for example, this is 20 Newtons. This is also 20 Newtons. The only difference here is this is, you know, in a negative direction, this is in a positive direction. They're always going to be in opposite directions, but always going to be same magnitude. All right. Same thing happens if both of them are negative. So this is negative, this is negative. Same idea. They're going to repel each other with same force magnitude, but opposite direction. So they repel. If Q1 and Q2 same charge, and then they attract if Q1, Q2 opposite charge. That means, for example, if Q2 happened to be then a positive charge instead of a negative charge, then you know the whole thing changes instead of repelling each other, they're gonna attract each other. So there's gonna be a force toward each other. So there's gonna be F, you know, let's say this is the same F21. There's gonna be F12. The, the difference here is gonna be, you know, now F21 is gonna be positive and F12 is gonna be negative, let's say. That means they attract each other if the charges are opposite and they repel each other if the charges are same, okay? So this is what we're gonna be exploring, what we're gonna be investigating in this lab too. Interaction between two charged particles and then the forces that they exert each other. All right, the person who actually did a lot of investigation and derived an equation that relates the force to some of the quantities in the experiment was Charles Coulomb. And the equation that describes how the force, electric force behaves, you know, between two charged particles with the finite distance between them is known as a Coulomb's law. And that's the equation we're gonna be exploring today. And the that equation, let's say generally F of E, that's how I write that, that means electric force. Experimentally, it was determined that this force is directly proportional to the product of the Q1 and Q2. So the electric force is directly proportional to Q1 and Q2. But also experimentally, it was determined that this force is inversely proportional to their distance. And not only to their distance, but to their distance square. So that's why this is known as the inverse square law. So these two relationships are very important because you can see, right, it's force is directly proportional to the product of Q1 and Q2 but force is inversely proportional to their distance square, which means that if I make the charges bigger, right? So let's say instead of, for example, you know, remember the units for the charge is pretty much after, you know, Coulomb is it's, it's in Coulomb. So let's say if this is, you know, a five micro Coulomb, if I make this, you know, let's say it's five micro Coulomb, this is five micro Coulomb. If I double each charge, then I'm making the force stronger. Because if this is, you know, double, this one is also double, then force becomes four times, okay? It's a linear direct relationship between force and charge. In terms of then the distance, you can see, right, it's one over d square, which means that if this distance is smaller than before, then force will be then increasing. Because as d is, let's say, as d decreases, force increases or as D is increases, then force decreases. Further they are, weaker the force. Why? Because of, again, this relationship. And not only it's one over D, it's again, it's one over D square. That means, for example, if I double the distance between them, force becomes one fourth weaker. If I, you know, make the distance between them three times bigger, then force weakens by one nine, one over nine. That means because of this square, right? So the distance has, you know, really strong effect on the force. So that's why electric force generally is very weak, you know, at bigger distances. 
So only interaction at the very, very close distances can be absorbed. And we're gonna be able to also see that how in our experiment, when the force, when the charged particles get closer and closer toward one another, force magnitude actually will be increasing. That means, for example, think like this, if this is Q1 and this is Q2, and let's say this is then the distance between them. So let's say, for example, this is D1, right? So in this, you know, force one that I will calculate, this will be then um, Q1 and Q2, as we said, right? It's a product of the charges, then divided by D squared. Generally in physics, whenever you go from proportionality sign to equal sign, remember we had, you know, proportionality sign that I used before, you have to introduce a constant. And that constant is K, which is an electric constant. So K is equals to 8.99 times 10 to the nine. And the units are Newtons times meter square over Coulomb square. All right. So then this is then the equation for the electric force. And assuming that this is the distance that right now I have. Now, if I keep the Q1 and Q2 are the you know, same, but then start changing the distance. So for example, move this guy from here to a little bit closer. So now I have D2. So then what happens to force two, which is K Q1, Q2 over D2 square. Well, we can see that force two gonna be stronger than force one. Why? Because, well, particles are closer. So the force then gonna be stronger. Closer they are, stronger the force. Further they are, weaker the force. That means one of the things we're gonna be doing in this experiment is be able to investigate those relationships. That means is force really proportional to one over D squared? What it means is that if I'm looking at force and distance, I wanna see that is the force proportional to one over distance or the force proportional to one over distance squared? Okay, and the best way to do here is to look at the graph. Remember, for example, you have y equals x, or, or you know, let's say mx. This is equation that relates quantity y to quantity x. And the best way to see, you know, the data, um, let's say, obeying this type of relationship is measuring, you know, uh, y as a function of x and then plotting y times x and y under, you know, y and x, right? And according to coordinates and then getting the trend line. So in order for this, this one to be obeyed, that means y is proportional to x, we should expect a straight line, okay? That means if I take the data of y as a function of x and then plot it and then get a linear relationship like this, that means y is directly proportional to x. But what if I get a data and I get something like this or something like that, right? Well, this is, that means y is not proportional to x. There is something different. So if I have, example, for example, if I have this type of relationship, well, this is y is proportional to x squared, right? This parabolic relationship. How about this, you know, this one over here? What if my data is something like this? Well, this one, y is equals to one over x, right? So that means, you know, hopefully you guys remember, right? Sort of like some of those uh, graphical um, equations and things like that. But this is how you experimentally verify the relationship. That's one, that's what those scientists did. You know, they did hundreds and thousands of experiments and tediously took data and plotted them and everything. And in order to get, let's say an equation like this. And that's what we're gonna be also looking at. All right, again, our goal will be using, uh, you know, our knowledge of, let's say, electric interaction. Now, again, as we said, right, if you have a charged particles and there again, you can use the, um, let's say, instruments where, you know, I'm gonna talk about them when, when I show you the lab to charge the, you know, some objects. Let's say if you charge an object and let's say you have charged objects, right? So Q1, another one, let's say Q2, um, you can then see how those forces, you know, let's say related to one another, how the distance affects the force, how the charges affect the force and so on and so forth. So for example, if both of them Q1 and Q2 are, let's say the same, there's gonna be, uh, let's say a force. 
this is two on one, and then this is one on two, and this is a repulsive force. And you're gonna be able to, let's say, see how charges and distance, you know, affect the value of force. All right, and using this equation, F equals K, Q1, Q2 divided by distance squared. Now, you have to also understand that, for example, if I'm doing this for force that one exerts on two, if I'm calculating the magnitude of the force that two exerts on one is exactly the same. That means, you know, remember the magnitude is exactly the same. All right, so this is more or less the theory for this, for this lab. Now, let's go to the experiment itself. And this experiment is gonna be our first experiment that's gonna be done on Pivot Interactive. So first thing you need to do is go to our Canvas page, get the information for the pivot and use that information to go and register for the Pivot Interactive. Let me show you those steps as well. All right, so let's go to our Canvas page. So this is what you should be seeing. This is a student view. So I have lab one. Um, and here I have lab uh, schedule. Here I have a welcome letter. So if you click on welcome letter, you should be then given information about the lab, uh, lab let's say registration and everything for the Pivot Interactive. So you can see right after lab one, um, all the labs then will be done on Verni Interactive. So that means you need to be registering. There's a liberal, you know, a small fee compared to you know a lot of other things that we have. Uh, but this allows you to have access to all the you know experiments that we're going to be conducting. So there's a class key. So you can just click on this, and the link will already open, um, and will be you know class key included, right? So here then let's say confirm and go and register uh, and get access to, you know, which is direct, will directly link to my class, okay, to my, you know, uh, Pivot Interactive class that I already set up, and right away then you will get access to this lab, okay. So once you get access to this lab, then you should be then able to do the experiments, and starting, you know, basically lab two, all the labs will be done on Pivot Interactive. That means, you know, the graphs and answering question, the calculation and everything, will be done on Pivot Interactive. And uh, I'm gonna be then grading over there as well. And then at the very end, then transferring the grades from Pivot Interactive to Canvas page. But your grades basically, um, that means, you know, let's say submissions and everything will be done on Pivot Interactive. After lab one, you will not be submitting anything to Canvas. Everything should be then submitted to Pivot Interactive. All right, so. Once you do all the registration and thing like that, then you should be able to have access to our lab two, which is gonna be uh, this one over here, force and electric charge, force versus distance. All right, so you can see, right, learn, learning objectives to explore the forces uh, exerted between electrically charged objects. Again, there's a little, little bit of theory over here, you know, uh, let's say uh, you, should, you should be able to, you know, read this on your own, and I have a one simple, you know, um, problem that I want you guys to get started with. Again, this is sort of like, let's say, pre-lab assignment, right? So let's say before going to doing anything else, you know, uh, it's important that you should be able to understand how to, something, to do something like this. So if you're given two charges, right? Negative 20 microcoulomb and 50 microcoulomb, and they're separated by a distance of 2.5 centimeter, what is the magnitude of the force on, let's say, each sphere? Let's say given those two spheres. Is it attractive repulsive so hopefully the you know the pre-lab lecture right the theory will allow you to um, easily calculate and solve this problem all right now when we go to the part one this is when then our experiment will start okay and the pivot interactive labs are in a way in, in my opinion the closest thing we can get to actual experiments so Obviously, it's not the same as when you're doing the experiments, when you're setting up the, the, the setup and measuring and things like that. But at least, you know, considering the circumstances, right, this is actually, you know, quite good. So, for example, let's look at this lab one. So, uh, all the pivot interactive labs are a video of an experiment that will allow you to change some of the settings 
So for example, here in this experiment, you can see, right? Uh, you have two spheres, uh, you, know, one, you know, one sphere connected by, let's say some kind of string or something like that. Another, you know, uh, sphere. So let's say, uh, thing like this. So here's, you know, let's say I can say that this is my Q2 and then here's my, my Q1. Those are my two charges, okay. And then from their center to center, there is gonna be, you know, distance D. Okay, so that's gonna be distance D between those two, you know, spheres. All right. Experiment then gonna be taking those two spheres, which are initially neutral, charging them, and then measuring the force they exert on one another. In order for us to be able to measure the force, we have Q1 on scale. You can see, right, it's on top of a scale. Then when there is a force acting on Q1 due to Q2, then the scale actually gives you that magnitude of the force for that distance, okay? And as the distance changes between them, then we can see that force, remember, changes when there is a change in distance, then the magnitude of the force will change as well, okay? So that means our goal, you can see, right? You can see in this video, we have, um, so in this video, we have a hanging sphere going to be brought closer to a sitting sphere. That means Q2 going to be get closer and uh, moved closer to Q1 once they're, you know, we charge them. And our goal is to develop mathematical relationship between the force exerted on the spheres at the distance between them. All right, so now let's look at, let's say the video itself. So let me clear all this. All right. So now one of the things we can change here, you can see, right? If I click here, it says change. I have different configuration, positive, 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 negative, 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 and negative versus positive. That means we start with two spheres that are positively charged, okay? And then we're gonna go to two spheres that are negative. You know, one part is positive, the other one is negative. Then negative, negative, and then negative, positive. That means we kind of change the, you know, let's say the charge of each one for the, all the experiments. All right, so let's, let's see what we have. Now we have positive versus positive. All right, let's try again. All right, so we're charging Q2. Then we're charging Q1. Now both of them are positively charged. And then you can see, right? So if I pause, that is the magnitude of this, of the force of those two charged particles when they are separated by this distance right now. Okay. Now let's see what happens afterwards. Now we move the Q2 closer and then look at the reading. So it increased. Move even closer, look at the reading. So it increased even more. And then we move it even closer. And you can see, right, as we move it closer and closer, the reading basically represents the force magnitude and it increases. All right, so that was the experiment. Now, what do we do with this? Well, one of the things we can do is to use, you can see, right? There's this sort of like a toolbar icon. So if you click on that, for example, then you get a tool, which is in this case, a ruler. Using then the ruler, we can measure the distance between the spheres from the center of one to the center of the other one. And then using the scale, we can have then force. So what we're gonna be doing with those two, that means we have now two direct measurements, magnitude of force and the distance. 
That means one of the things you know you should be doing here is let's say going back. So let's say you can see right. You know if I play the video like this. So going back, and then right after they charge both of them. So you see like let they charge the first one, second one, and then charge the first one. And then, you know, here's the reading before they start moving anything else. Okay. That means this is going to be the magnitude of the force that those charges exert on one another. Or you can say, let's say that Q2 exerting on Q1, for example. And the distance between them, now I can measure using this ruler. I place it here. And then I can see that you know, one of the things I can do, I can zoom in actually like this. I can read that the distance right now between them is, you can say this is a centimeter. So 10 centimeters, 20, 30, 40. So maybe 42 points. So it's between 42 and 43. That means I have to estimate. So it's 42 points something, right? Not quite 43. So I would say 42.1 or something like that. So let's say 42.2 centimeters. Okay, that's the distance. That means when they are 42.2 centimeters apart, then the reading of the force, you can see, right, is 0.25 Newtons. Now, what I'm gonna do with that information, I'm gonna come back down here and I'm gonna, you know, get the experimental data. And you can see, right, they use, you have already a table here ready to go. What we're gonna do here is then take, you can see, right, it says force, distance, Newtons. The, this is basically F representing the force. M is the units for the distance. Because thing like this, if, if I don't have this, it shows that, for example, column name. What is the column name? Well, I'm gonna call this force because this column is gonna represent the force. What is the units? Well, in Newtons. And I see what is the variable? I can represent it as a F, F for the force. Now. And the same thing basically for the distance. Okay, I come back again. I say, all right, so point 20, uh, this, you can see, right, 25, but this is not quite 25. See, if I zoom in, see where the decimal point is. So this is the decimal point because it's 0 0.000025. So basically 0 0.00025. So, I can represent this in terms of like, let's say scientific notation, or I can just, you know, write exactly that. Because one very important thing to know is this, Coulomb's equation, right? Coulomb's like equation for electric force, when you write as F equals K, Q1, Q2 over R or D square, it's assumed that D is in meters and Q here is in, let's say, Q is in coulombs. So then the force will be in Newtons, okay? That means if you're representing force in Newtons, then distance cannot be in centimeters, right? So that means it has to be in, in meters. We are using what we call SI units, right? And uh, as, you know, SI unit for the distance here is in meters, force in Newtons and things like that. All right, that means going back, uh, let me do this. So going back over here, I'm gonna say, all right, so when force is zero point, or you can say, right, when the distance, right, was 42.2, I think I said, which is 0 0.422. That's, you know, even in terms of the, um, I can represent this like a D if you want, right? D or R again, doesn't matter. So then I can say that this is 0 0.00025 Newtons. This is my first data point. When they are four, you know, 0 0.422 meters apart, that's the force. Then we start measuring the force at a different length. So see, then they move it and as you can see, right? They kind of stopped. So, and then look at the reading. That means right now it's 0 0.0029 when they are about, um, I would say 36.3. Right, so about 36.3 centimeter apart. So you're gonna, then you're gonna write that down. So um, 0 0.00029 when they are 0 0.33, what did I say? 
no, 362. 362 apart. Okay. And then you can see, right? Then you're going to continue. So let's say it goes and he stops. Now it is 48, right? So 0 0.00048 Newtons when they are closer to one another. And the distance here is right now, um, I would say 27.9 or something like that, right? That means when this is 0 0.279, Force is 0 0.00048, 0 0.00048. Well, I imagine I don't really need to do more measurements. You already more or less understand what I'm doing. The only thing what I would do here is this. Remember, this is the force for the positive, positive configuration. So I'll just leave it like that, positive slash positive. And then this is distance for that, okay? Now, what I'm gonna then have you guys do with this, you know, this data, obviously, you know, you want to go all the way, right? So you want to go all the way. And um, one thing I would, you know, let's say I would say you guys do here is every time they stop, right? You measure, you measure, you measure all the way until you can see, right? 482, that's the last measurement they need to more or less have, right? Or 485. That means you go all the way until, you know, they move the spheres away from one another. That means you're gonna have maybe like, let's say roughly 10 uh, measurements or something like that. All right, once you're done, then we're gonna use that data to plot. Remember, as I said, right, in the, in the, um, uh, in the theory lecture, that means in order to see if the Y and X are directly proportional, right? So we plot this as Y equals MX. And if the graph is a straight line, then the, this quantity y and quantity x are directly proportional. Okay, so then let, for example then, if you wanna see if the y, uh, let's say if the force measurement and the distance measurements, are they directly proportional or not? Okay, so let's do that. So in order for me to see if the force and distance are directly proportional, I can plot, you know, say if you, you click the configure vertical axis and then you get, um, this window where it says, all right, so data column, select the data column. And right now I have, those are my columns, right? Force, positive, positive, and distance. Well, what I want here, I want to have a force on the, uh, let's say, Y axis, no uncertainty needed here. Then I wanna configure my horizontal, which then will be my distance. All right, so if I do that, I'm gonna get something like this. All right, so, well, you can see, right, if I plot force versus distance, well, they're not directly proportional. Look at look at the, the, the data I have. It's even gonna be, if I come back here, see over here on the right side, top right of the graph, if I click, it says curve fits. And let's say if I click on that, I can look at in terms of, are they proportional? You can see that's not. Are they AX plus B? No. Are they A, Y equals AX squared? No. How about, um, why a x well this is getting a little bit closer see you know that means y in this case force x is distance and it's looking at in terms of is the force equals you know something over x well not really but for example if i do y equals a over x square see more or less i'm already getting closer and closer to the fit of this remember i only took three out of possible like let's say 10 11 data points so your graph will definitely look much better if you do that. So now, that means this is what you're gonna do. Plot your data and try to find the right fit. Okay, so then you're gonna basically talk about that. One thing to remember though, is that you can say, right, F equals A D squared. So that's gonna be your experimental fit, let's say. But what if you wanna lean, you know, linearize it? Now, what do we mean by linearize your data? Linearizing data means that find some kind of relationship between distance and force, where when you're plotting, it's a straight line like this. What is force directly proportional to in terms of the distance that this is gonna be giving us, let's say a straight line. And one of the things we're gonna see here is that this basically tells us that, that once you find this, you know, let's say correct fit, you can say, right, Correct fit is F equals some constant over D squared. 
right? That means the force is proportional to one over d squared. And that's what I showed you in a, in a lecture too, right? Now then, how do we make this graph linear? Well, one of the things we're gonna be able to do is see if I plot force versus one over d squared, you can see, right? It's proportional to one over d squared. If I do force versus one over d squared, I'm gonna get a straight line. That means you're gonna need to do that as well, okay? So first do the, do the first graph, then take a screenshot of that, which then you should be, for example, including here. So one of the things we can do, for example, take a screenshot of that on your computer of the graph, right? The first graph. And then, you know, you can see, right? When you come to this part two, when it's asking you questions and things like that, you know, you can then include that graph or screenshot of that graph, but you can see right there's an option over here to upload a picture right there, to upload a picture. So if you click on that, then you should be able to go to your computer and then maybe like, let's say open some kind of, you know, uh, let's say for example, some kind of picture file or something like that. Okay, so do the graph, take a screenshot, include it here and then talk about basically, the, you know, what type of graph you get, okay. That means, you know, you're gonna be able to see if it's, you know, one of these graphs or something like that. Then in order for us to linearize the graph, again, you can, as I mentioned, right? You can then plot force versus one over D square, right? So what do we do that? How do we do that? Well, this is what, what, what you should do. Come back to the data table and say, all right, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna add another column to the right and I'm gonna say, this is one over distance squared. Then the unit is gonna be then one over meter squared because if one over distance squared then the units are one over meter squared. And then the variable just one over D squared, let's say again, we can do it like this. All right. Now remember, you're gonna have 11 data points or 10, 11 data points. You're not, you don't wanna go and calculate this for every you know, data, data point for the distance the table itself does the calculation for you like Excel does. There's a formula. You click on this and you can see, right? It says change column formula. Then what you wanna do here, you, have, you want the column to have a formula where one over distance square. So you can say it's one divided by distance. And then, you know, you can say, right? You can choose this square like that. When you submit, that column now is a distance square, one over distance square, sorry. That means it takes this distance and does one over that distance square. Now, remember our goal is to linearize the graph. That means it's a linear, you know, straight line. Force versus distance doesn't give us that because force is not proportional to distance. Force is proportional to one over distance square. So then if I go back to this call, you know, to the, the horizontal axis and click instead of distance, I have one over distance square, then I'm gonna get a different data. Well, the fit that I had before doesn't work anymore. So then I go and see if this linear graph, linear fit will be better this time around. And indeed it is much better, right? Which is then, that means if the force versus this uh, one over distance square, this particular graph, you know, yield a straight line like that. That means this verifies that force is proportional to one over D square. Now, in this particular, in, in this particular, you know, example, what you're doing is this. Remember force equals K times Q1, Q2 divided by D square. We're using this equation. The idea here is this then, what we're doing here is we're plotting force and one over D square. That means everything else is basically a constant. That means K, Q1, Q2 is a constant that this graph represents as A. You can see, right? Here's the equation for that. So you can see, right? Force equals A, then times one over D square, then plus B, where B is the intercept, whatever it is, okay? Now, one of the things that we have here is then the A itself then is nothing but the product of K, Q1, and Q2. 
right? A is the product, which is basically proportionality constant. Because remember, we're not changing the Q1 or Q2, right? Once we charge those spheres, they are basically the same charge. What we're doing here, we're changing the distance between them and that changes the force. But Q1, Q2 always the same. So that's why for us, proportionality, you know, constant includes Q1 and Q2 because they never change throughout the entire experiment. Anyways, so once you do this, uh, then you can leave this graph, which is force versus one over distance squared, okay? And take a screenshot of the force versus distance graph. So then you can talk about that, what type of, let's say, relationship force has to distance, let's say, right? So again, take a screenshot of your very first graph and then include that in the part two discussion, which is right here, okay? All right, so now there's one other thing you're gonna be doing. I don't want you guys to do all four configurations. What I'm gonna have you do is come back here and then choose one other one. So let's say if you did, if you did positive, positive, right? So do something else, okay? So you can choose a negative, negative. Or, but probably it's interesting, it's a little more interesting to do like, let's say um, different ones, right? One, you know, you can, let's say you can do positive, negative, like let's say, you know, positive, negative, and the other one we do, let's say, I don't know, negative, negative. That means you don't take one where, you know, two experiments where both of them are the same. Take one where both of them are the same, the other one is when they're opposites. So you can just sort of like, let's say what exactly, you know, happens, what different between those type of experiments. That means one thing you're gonna do here, you're gonna come back to this force, positive, positive, and have another column to the right of that. And let's say have force, I don't know, maybe positive, negative, or whatever you choose, right? And then, you know, have the experimental values for that. And then when you come back over here, you can have two forces plotted together. See, for the vertical axis, you can go and say add column, and then you can choose positive, negative in this case, for example, and then you're gonna get two plots on one graph, okay? Because both of them are measured with respect to the same distance, right? So that means distance doesn't change for both of them. Uh, that means both of them are have the same vertical axis, uh, horizontal axis distance. So you can plot two vertical quantities together and then get two graphs. Okay, and that's kind of like what I expect you guys to do. All right, so again, this is taking a little bit longer time because this is the first lab using the pivots. So I'm kind of, you know, giving you all the um, little details. One very, you know, useful tool that they added in the pivot is when you click here, you can see, right, it says data table and graph help. So you can click on this and you get to, a, you know, let's say their, their support page for how to do the graphs, data tables and things like that. So you can watch my video, let's say, you know, that's one of the things about this video lecture that I post, right? You can always go back and rewatch them again and things like that, right? But you know they also have this help, so they you know they pretty much show you all of these things: how to do the graph, get the table, plot, find the curve, and all of those things. Okay, so let's say we come back over here because our experiment has. By the way, there there are then some questions that you want to you know answer right by the time you know let's say you get to part two. That means you do the experiment, you get the information. And then you discuss that in you know questions two, three, and four. Okay. Then let's say go to part two. Part two is another experiment. It says, what is the relationship between force and amount of charge? Okay. Remember, we talked about charge as some kind of quantity that remains constant, but let's say, can we use then, you know, let's say the charge or the information that we have to find the charge? Okay. By the way, I highly recommend whenever there's a part for the pivot where there's a calculation to do that on a separate piece of paper and then upload that your up, upload your work on pivot instead of like trying to you know let's say type everything here because if you, you know technically it, it has the option to do equations so let's say f equals ma you know it can do that but for example it's much easier to just do your work by hand and then just upload you know up, upload the picture of your work okay so that means here's another, another experiment which says in this video, the amount of charge is changed. Every time the, you know, the bottom sphere is charged by coming in contact with a charged metal sphere, 
its charge lowers by a factor of one half. All right, so because we don't know the original charge of either sphere, we can call the initial charge on each of them 100, which makes the charge 50 after being discharged once, and then 25 after, you know, second time and so on and so forth. So we're gonna, you know, let's say here's the question, it says describe briefly what data you will need to, you know, you will take and how you will analyze to find the relationship between force and charge. Okay, so think about it and so just put it there in terms of what, you know, again, use the previous, you know, experiment, you know, as a guide. All right, so then we're coming back to this experiment. One of the things you can see here is, so let's say trial one, trial two, trial three. Okay, so now this is a little bit different experiment because see what we do in this experiment. All right, so now, again, in this particular part, we are investigating if the force is directly proportional to the charge. Remember, it's technically, remember, is the product of Q1 of Q2. But for example, the top one, Q2, we're not changing. It's a constant. But Q1 is going to be then changed. And the question is that if I'm changing Q1, Will the force change proportionally? Now, remember what we, you know, kind of, you know, talked about in the right, right before the experiment, that every time we charge, right, we uncharge, it loses its charge by a factor of half. Okay, that means let's say we start with 100. That means if I come back here and I'm going to take an experimental data, where this is going to be charge. Okay, so remember charge has units of coulombs and I can just say Q like this for the charge. And then this is then the force, which is units of Newtons Oops. and variable F. So that means I'm starting with hundred and then we do it again. But second time it loses its charge by a factor of half. That means it's gonna be 50 then it's gonna be 25. Then it's gonna be um, half of that, right? 12.5 and so on and so forth, let's say. So that means when I come back here, see when first one they charge the top and then they charge the bottom. So we can say that this, this reading here is for 100. That means when the charge is, let's say some 100 quantity. What is the force? Is 0 0.00152. Now, what does it mean? Okay, by the way, I'm gonna take a data for trial one. So do not use trial one when you're doing this experiment, okay? Use trial two or trial three. But since I'm taking the data point, I don't want you just copy my data points and then, you know, not do the experiment. So I'm, I'm giving you the demo of using the trial one and then you can use either two or three, up to you. All right, so this is for the first, you know, let's say Q. Then you can see right after this, they charge it again, uh, they discharge it again, or you know, that when they touch it discharges. So then it's 0 0.74. So it's 0 0.074. Well, I'm missing another two zeros. Okay. Then if I go, all right, so what's now? It's 0 0.039, 0 0.0039. Then, you know, let's say one eight roughly, 0 0.00018. 
I'm missing another zero here. And let's say it's enough. The idea here is this. If I'm plotting force versus charge, remember, if they are directly proportional like the equation suggests, I should get a straight line. Okay. And then if I try to then, let's say, fit y equals ax, it should be a straight line like that. And you can see, right, data fits perfectly. Because if you keep distance, and you can see, right, I did not change the distance for this entire experiment. Remember, force is equals to k, q1, q2 over distance square. For this part two, oops. So q2 is basically constant, doesn't change. D, d, d square, right, distance is basically also constant doesn't change. Well, K is already a constant. It's electric constant. That means I can say then force is equal to some constant, some number, right? Some constant times Q, Q2. Because all of those things, right? Sorry, Q1. I think this is Q1. All of those things, right? Those are, you know, those are constants. So that means force is proportional to Q1. And if I'm plotting force versus Q1, I should get a straight line like that. All right, and that's basically the equation two, uh, sorry, uh, experiment two, um, investigating how the force related to the, you know, let's say one of the charges in this case, specifically, you know, the bottom charge. And as you change the charge, what happens to your force? If you increase the force or if you decrease the charge, does it decrease the, you know, the force. If you increase the charge, does it increase the force? So those are the relationships we were looking in this particular experiment. All right, guys. So then the pretty much after that is just you know answer, you know, the basic discussion about this experiment, about your result. And then that's it for this experiment. So hopefully, you know, you'll be able to follow through. And if 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 you have any questions, um, you know, send me an email, put it in a discussion board, or you know, come to office hours. All right.